Good afternoon, everyone. There, there's lots of room in the seats here if uh, people want to come up and join us. Thank you all for coming. Recording uh, in progress. Thank you for coming to join us. Uh, my name is Michael McLeod, and I'm the Member of Parliament for the Northwest Territories. So welcome. I'm very uh, pleased to extend a warm welcome to my colleague, the Honorable Mark Holland, Canada's Minister of Health and Minister Samler. My first opportunity to introduce her as a minister. Uh, so Minister Semler is a Minister of Health and Social Services for the Northwest Territories. I also uh, saw our new speaker here uh, in the crowd. Uh, welcome, Shane. And um, I think uh, all Canadians uh, are very clear when they say they want and deserve a health care system that provides family access to health services wherever and whenever they are needed. As, as such, we are pleased to be here with you for this very important announcement, which will see increased access to primary care, support, various mental health services, and help strengthen our community and our long-term services. And I'd also like to extend a very big thank you to the Legislative Assembly of Northwest Territories for, for hosting us here today. And so uh, it's my honor to introduce to you the Honorable Mark Holland, Minister of Health. Minister Holland was first elected as the Member of Parliament for Ajax in 2004 and served till 2011. And he was re-elected uh, in 2015, 2019, and, and again in 2021. As the Member of Parliament, Minister Holland has served as a leader of the government uh, in the House of Commons as the Chief Government Whip, the Parliament Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, and he's been a very staunch advocate of uh, marriage equal equality rights and played a key role in helping to reform Canada's animal cruelty laws in both public and public roles. Uh, public and private roles, Minister Holland has backed health-related initiatives. He served as the Executive Director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada's Ontario's mission, as well as the National Director for Ch Children and Youth. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage my colleague, Minister Mark Holland. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here again in uh, in Yellowknife, in the Northwest Territories, in, uh, in this such such a beautiful, special place. Uh, and we had a wonderful opportunity today, uh, Minister uh, Semler and I, uh, along with Michael uh, and the Premier to talk with uh, uh, Indigenous leaders uh, from across the, uh, the territory, uh, talking about the challenges uh, that are being faced here in Northwest Territories. You know, we think of the pandemic and the, uh, the trauma that that was uh, and the strain that that placed on our health system, uh, creating backlog and workforce issues. Uh, and certainly uh, in the Northwest Territories, uh, that was no exception. Uh, and then add on top of that the devastating impact of the wildfires uh, and uh, the, the additional challenges that are already faced uh, by First Nation uh, Inuit and Métis people as a result of uh, the devastating impacts of colonialism, uh, the continuing impacts of racism within our system, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and so that's why I'm, I'm so excited to be here in person uh, to continue uh, the relationship that the federal government has with the Northwest Territories, uh, to get an opportunity to work with uh, Minister Semler uh, and the Premier and uh, the entire government here in Northwest Territories, as well as nation to nation with First Nations um, to tackle the challenges that are facing our health system. So today, uh, I'm pleased to say we're signing an agreement that will see more than $36 million flow into healthcare system here in the Northwest Territories over the next number of years. First is the Working Together Agreement, which will provide $24 million over the next three years. This is going to see critical investments to recruit and retrain uh, more doctors and nurses so that more folks have access to primary care. 
It's going to ensure expanded access to, uh, to addiction services, including virtual care and detox hospital beds. And we heard certainly today uh, just how critical those needs are um, throughout the territory. To promote uh, mental health and prevent suicide, including funding for Indigenous culturally appropriate programs. I'm also pleased uh, that we're uh, signing today as well the Aging with Dignity Agreement. Uh, to provide more than $12 million over the next five years. And that funding is absolutely critical to make sure that folks who have worked their whole lives can have be afforded the opportunity to age with dignity in places um, that are culturally appropriate uh, and respect their needs. This uh, funding will ensure that we have new tools that will allow for data-driven and personalized home and community care services uh, to again address the challenges around nurses and personal support workers and increase the amount of direct care long-term residents receive every day. It will also go towards purchasing new equipment, improving training and hygiene practices for uh, long-term care facilities, as well as ensuring Indigenous elders receive culturally appropriate care that responds to their unique needs. C'est une attente qui est tellement importante, pas juste pour le territoire nord-ouest, mais aussi pour le Canada, d'augmenter la qualité de notre système de santé. Le financement accordé par cet accord aujourd'hui va aider à de recruter davantage de médecins et d'infirmières, recruter des infirmières pour augmenter la qualité de soins directs, que les résidents de longue durée reçoivent chaque jour et aussi d'améliorer l'accès aux services d'aide aux toxiques humains, y compris les soins virtuels et le lit d'hôpital. C'est l'investissement qui, euh, qui est dans le temps aujourd'hui, c'est tellement important pour ça. Et pour cette raison-là, je suis tel, vraiment content d'être ici aujourd'hui. Uh, because, as I say, after a lifetime of contributing, after a lifetime of hard work, certainly our seniors deserve to be able to have a healthy and dignified retirement. Together, these agreements uh, represent a really important step forward in our uh, progress that we're trying to make nationally. Uh, this is the uh, sixth agreement that I've been able to announce across the country. Uh, I'm very excited that uh, we're going to be announcing others, and it's part of $200 billion the federal government is investing in health care over the next 10 years um, to make sure that, uh, that we do what is needed to have a strong, vibrant health care system. We have one of the best health care systems in the world, and through working together, I think we can achieve the greatest health care system in the world, and it will happen because we all pull in the same direction. And I really appreciate that spirit here in Northwest Territories with the government of Northwest Territories uh, and the, uh, the investments that, uh, that we're making uh, are, I think, going to make an appreciable difference as to the challenges that are in front of us. Uh, I uh, am pleased now uh, to turn it over to uh, my colleague, um, who I've enjoyed uh, starting to work with as you, uh, you take on this role, uh, Minister uh, Semler. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you to Minister Holland. As Minister of Health and Social Services, I am pleased to be able to announce that we have uh, two bilateral funding agreements between the government of the Northwest Territories and Health Canada. And as as, as Minister Holland has mentioned, these two um, agreements, you know, with us, when we work with our Indigenous partners here in the Northwest Territories, as we did this morning, you know, that is something that is important, the way that we are going to work in the Northwest Territories as a government. And so what we heard today just reinforces the the work that was put into these agreements. And so in creating these uh, funding action plans, we reviewed, we reviewed the engagements with Council of Leaders, MLAs, stakeholders, to ensure that these funds align with the federal government parameters. So under the Working Together to Improve Healthcare Bilateral Agreement, the Department of Health and Social Services, as mentioned, received $24.1 over three years um, for the four initiatives that include the integration of public health services into primary care for more effective and efficient service delivery. You know, we've seen the cracks in our system through COVID in our public health system. And so that is where, 
you know, we heard from Indigenous leaders throughout that time of all of those cracks, and we need to be able to respond to those, and this funding will be able to help us respond to those. To improve the training and recruitment of family practitioners to the NWT, continue mandatory cultural safety and anti-racism training for health and social services staff. You know, as myself, as an Indigenous person from the Northwest Territories, as a past health care provider, um, you know, and, you know, and as a past MLA, you know, this is one of the topics that I raised over and over again. And now I'm sitting on this side of the being able to integrate that work, you know, that and the things that we raised as regular members and the cultural safety, we need to be able to provide care for our Indigenous population. Those are the people that are, you know, struggling in our communities. Those are, you know, when we look at the rates of of our chronic diseases, it's our Indigenous people that are suffering. And so when we look at a culturally safe healthcare system, we want our Indigenous people to be comfortable to accessing this care. Establishment of an addictions medicine program for the treatment of opioid use disorder and alcohol withdrawal and com complex polysubstance use. We heard around the table this morning very clear that our communities are struggling. Our small communities don't have the means to combat this drug crisis that we're seeing across Canada there, you know, and so th this type of investment into our territory is going to help create programs that we can support those indigenous communities to help combat this drug use and the, the alcohol use. You know, we heard stories from the indigenous leaders on right through the community, how it's affecting them. And so that we want to be able to be there to work with them. Continual, continued culturally appropriate mental wellness and suicide prevention program, you know, and that's something that the last government stressed. And so that's where, you know, this money is going to help implement some of these programs and these plans that our Indigenous governments are coming up with on their own. And, you know, and we can be there to support them to be, you know, in order for them to run these programs, we need to have the funds to be able to do that. So this is where that's going to help. Under the Aging with Dignity Agreement, health and social services will receive $12.2 million over five years to support home and community care and long-term care for our elders. This work will include implementation of an assessment tool to identify clients' needs, monitor changes in healthcare status, and align services and resources to provide the best care and community supports available. Our elders, when we, when I think about my own life growing up, I was raised by my great grandparents. So our elders are the core of our, you know, when we're growing up, they are the center of our world. We are raised to be able to make sure that they're respected and that they can live in their traditional ways in their communities the best that they can. And these assessment tools that we can, that we have, will be able to make sure that we can meet those needs of those elders where they are in those communities. And when our services cannot, you know, when they exceed that, you know, the closest to home as they can. Um, improved infection and prevention and control of community care program to reduce the risk of infection disease to clients and staff. Uh, again, you know, we, we've seen this during COVID throughout Canada. You know, our seniors are compromised. Our Indigenous leaders over the last government raised and, you know, uh, NWT might have looked like one of the most closed down territory province in the world you know, because we were protecting our asset and our asset was our elders. And so, you know, we need to we need to make sure that there's funding there that we can um, protect them. Establishing ad additional clinical staff to increase hours of long term care to clients. And, you know, and I think this this investment to increase the hours of direct long term care to clients, you know, is is very important because you know our our seniors that live, especially in our communities, when we provide services, they need services beyond the hours of normal operating hours, and so we need to make sure that they're able to have those services on weekends and after hours, so that you know they're staying home, their families are being supported, um, and this the, again, this is what this money will do. All these programs, you know, when we took a, take a look at the two agreements and everything that I was saying, these are just able to enhance what we already know and what we've been doing, but to, you know, to uh, grow those programs so that they better meet the needs of our, our residents. So taking together these two agreements, respond to the issues we've heard from leaders 
and residents talk about and will help to advance these priorities over the next three to five years. We are committed to working to ensure our health and social service system meets the demand for culturally safe services, addresses the disparity in our health outcomes for Indigenous residents. And I look forward to working with the federal government to meet our shared goals. Thank you. Thank you to both ministers, Minister Hall and Minister Semler. Uh, we're going to move on to the, the next part of our uh, agenda today, and that's going to be uh, the Q&A portion. And we will have Miranda Bolstead. Okay, uh, Jack's going to do it? Okay. Uh, we'll have Jack, uh, Jack mo do the moderation and then we'll uh, move on to do the, the actual signing and photos. Thanks everyone. Uh, I, my name is Jack Miltenberger. I work with Cabinet Communications here at the Legislative Assembly uh, and we're going to turn into the in-person media Q&A portion. Uh, media are asked to remember to direct their questions to the appropriate people. Uh, one question and one follow-up, and if we need to do another loop around, we definitely can. Please state your name, uh, what outlet you are with, and who you would like to speak to. Ollie? Ollie Williams, Catholic Radio. Question for both of you, with John Klein Buzz answering it. The Northwest Territory spends more than $600 million a year on health, but it never comes in on budget at that either. It's hard to understand the numbers alone, what kind of difference this will make. Will it be small? Will it be incremental at first? Or will there be some significant changes in the level of care that's going to be offered here? How would you characterize the difference that this funding announced today is going to actually make in practice to residents of the NWP here in Please go first, Minister. Minister Sam. Thank you for the question. Um, this this funding, you know, is direct funding so that we could tackle some of the issues that are affecting our communities. It's an incremental funding. Um, it's an addition, you know, to what the funding that we have. When you speak to, you know, some of the, the deficit and stuff, you know, a lot of that is when we look at those things within the tariff, like within our budget, those are things that are out of our control. You know, within health, there's there's only so much that we can do to budget for the year and then that you know when it becomes issues that impact health so you know we had we have a health crisis and you know like shortage of nurses and shortage of doctors and shortage of healthcare practitioners and specialists so the cost of sending people to those services have increased and those are things that we just you know we don't know when people are going to get sick or when they're going to need a specialist or when they're going to need to travel so those are some of those things but this is the, you know, the, for this stuff here is if we can tackle and get, you know, and actually do the health promotion part and the preventative part, then, you know, that will be able to handle maybe some of those costs that we're not being able, you know, keeping people in the territory, um, training more health professionals to stay in the territory, you know, keeping people healthier so they're not having to, you know, access outside of territory services. Um, you know, and those are those are just some of the, you know, ways of that that I, that I can respond to that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, first of all, so there's a couple of different streams. So what we're announcing today is part of uh, 25 billion dollars over 10 years that are targeted um, uh, dollars or bespoke specific agreements in provinces and territories. But there is, is of course, uh, outside of that, an overall commitment of the $200 billion, which includes a 5% escalator, um, meaning that every year, uh, health transfers from the federal government are going up by more than 5%. And there's a number of other components within that $200 billion. So this isn't the only money that's there. There's other dollars. I would also say that, um, you know, we had a wonderful meeting uh, of course, Minister Semler wasn't yet the uh, the Minister of Health at that moment in time, but in Charlottetown talking to ministers of health about health transformation generally, because it's not just dollars. It's also the importance of data. It's the importance of being upstream uh, in prevention. It's the importance of housing. It's the importance of, uh, of so many of the social determinants of health. And uh, so what we need to do 
uh, to make uh, an appreciable difference to people, and I'm getting specifically to your question, is, um, is to make these investments so that we both tackle the, the, the crisis that we have now in terms of health workforce, uh, but that secondly, we, we start seeing a reduction in the pressures on our health system so that we can have better health outcomes. You're not going to see a revolution overnight. Um, the problems are deep and systemic. But what you are going to be able to see, and one of the things that's so important in these, in these agreements, is to have indicators where we have common indicators uh, across all provinces and territories so you can see in data how the health system is improving year over year. So uh, to get to the point where we put these problems in the rearview mirror, we need to make these investments and then be able to show in data how it's going to be moving. So, uh, you know, will you see improvements right away? Yes. Uh, will it fix all the problems overnight? Absolutely not. That's not realistic. But what you will see is that line of progress. And I think the most powerful concept in human uh, conception, and I say this regularly, is the idea of compound interest. You know, when you when you have success, one success builds on the other, uh, and you have an ever stronger system. Uh, and that's uh, really what we're committed to. When you go back to Indigenous leaders and talk about what difference these agreements that we're talking about today will make, what are the examples you can use to show them here's what we here are some things we can do? <laughs> well, you know, and I think for for myself, when I am taking these agreements and going and, and putting them to work, they're already working. Like they're all, we've already, you know, started the, the work within the health authority and making these changes and bumping up this. And so what I'm hoping that we'll, you know, that we'll be able to go back is being able to see the changes and the access to their, you know, the concerns. Like as a minister, I get constituent concerns from every MLA on, you know, addiction services and access to addiction services and medical travel. And, you know, and, and so these are the things that I think that will be able to be measured by going back and saying, you know, we've decreased, you know, like we've been able to service the communities better, you know, and I think with our seniors, you know, we have uh, continuous concerns from uh, our communities on services for our seniors. You know, and I think having our seniors to remain at home as long as they can, we're going to hear those things. And this is the conversation that we're having around the table with Indigenous leaders. And I mean, myself being, you know, and as I said, as 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 minister, you know, I mean, the department is collecting this data and, you know, and, and they'll they'll be within our within our fiscal responsibility. We need to be measuring the services that we're providing. And so that that will all be able to be reported back to the Indigenous governments. And, you know, and that's the thing is if we bring it back and they're still seeing concerns, then that's where we're going to be fluid and we're going to be able to say, okay, this is not working in our system. So how do we fix it? And what kind of things do we want to change? And where can we change it? And I think that's the kind of department that I know that the staff that work in there, you know, the, you don't get into healthcare if you don't care about people. And so I think that's the, the messages that I would like for the people and, you know, anyone to get from this message is that any money that we're getting from the department or from the federal government that's going to enhance our program, you know, we're going to be measuring that and making sure that we're seeing those changes. And then if we don't see those changes, then, you know, we'll, 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 we will be hearing that from the Indigenous governments ourselves. So thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Did you have a follow-up as well for Minister Holland, or was just the one follow-up for the... Right on. Thank you. Uh, other media? All good. Uh, if there are no other local media bodies present, I will hand it off to the online moderator, Mark McDonald. Hi there. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're a journalist on the Zoom and wish to ask a question, please use the hand-raising function. Si vous êtes journaliste sur le Zoom et vous désirez poser une question, vous lisez l'option de lever la main. We have a question from David Thurden of CBC. Please go ahead, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Uh, my question is for Minister Holland. Um, 
Then, Sir Holland, where are pharmacare negotiations right now? We heard from your counterpart, Don Davies, with the NDP. He says that y'all exchanged proposals over the weekend. And he said one of the final sticking points is committing to a single payer system. Does that sum up where things are at right now? Well, I've said uh, all along that I, I, I'm not going to uh, publicly talk about uh, the details of uh, negotiations. I, I can't say at a high level, I reiterate uh, that the conversations we have have been very productive. Uh, I think we're moving towards uh, a uh, common ground uh, and uh, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to tab table legislation uh, by the deadline that was established as, uh, of March 1st. Uh, but, uh, you know, there in these things, I, I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, whether or not it was uh, the government house leader or now as Minister of Health, as you're having negotiations with different parties, uh, the dynamics are constantly shifting. Uh, and if I'm, uh, you know, sharing where we are at one moment, uh, it could move a completely different direction the next. Uh, and I think the public uh, would be left to be very confused. So I think it's important for us to uh, continue these conversations uh, with all parliamentarians, but specifically with uh, the NDP as we try to find uh, the, you know, the, uh, a place uh, where we're on the same page. Uh, and then once we're in a position where we're introducing legislation, I'll be more than happy uh, to kind of go back and, and talk about what the back and forth were and where the points of of difference were. But at this point in time, I don't think that's a constructive thing to do. Okay, I look forward to hearing that backstory. Um, but let me ask you this as a follow-up, and hopefully you can answer this. Uh, the, the, N the NDP says they want an incremental approach to pharmacare. In other, in other words, they don't want a national, they don't want national drug coverage all at once. Uh, further to that, we heard from Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, who called the liberal spin that uh, New Democrats want to see billions of dollars. He says they they're only asking for a bill. So maybe just help me understand comments you made in the past, because you've said that we need to consider the fiscal environment. Ambition needs to be ten tempered. If if all the NDP wants is a bill, why do we need to be so concerned about money at this point in time? Well, I, again, I think you know once we table the legislation, we'll be in a position to be able to talk about all of the various machinations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a bit of a disadvantage uh, where the NDP is making a decision to, uh, you know, share some of their internal thoughts, uh, and I'm not able to do the same. Uh, but what I will say is uh, that, you know, this is always intended to be framework legislation uh, that sets the foundation for what's going to happen in pharmacare later on, uh, that it's not going to have all the answers, and that we're not going to be in a position where uh, we can take on massive costs. Uh, and that has been a frame uh, from the beginning. And that's not a reflection of a uh, view inside of the negotiations. It's a reflection of the frame of which we were coming. Uh, and many questions that I get asked are, you know, how are you going to be able to afford a program that it would be full scale or, you know, things of this nature? That's what I'm responding to. Uh, what I haven't been willing to do is to go inside of those deliberations, uh, because I think that would be unfair, uh, both to those conversations and also confusing to the public, because as I say, we'll be moving back and forth. I think it's totally fair uh, at the conclusion of those negotiations for us to explain what the points of difference were. Uh, and what the various machinations were uh, and, and how we got to that point. Uh, and I understand all of the interest, uh, particularly with the NDP uh, talking uh, so, uh, so, so forcefully as, uh, as uh, the NDP leader did today about the importance of the deadline. Uh, but, you know, I think all of that is part of the, the give and the take and the, the negotiations. And I personally don't see uh, any value in trying to play that out publicly. Uh, I think what Canadians are interested in uh, is uh, is results, is seeing the legislation, is seeing how we're going to reduce drug prices, seeing how, um, you know, we can build on the important work we've already done. You know, you look at the bulk purchasing that we've done, seeing uh, a reduction in cost of about $300 um, uh, million dollars uh, for Canadians and their drug costs in this country uh, and creating a very enviable position. Uh, uh, and certainly that's why the United States was so interested in having access to our drugs, because we've been able to do some really important things to reduce costs for Canadians. We want to continue doing that. We don't want people to be in a circumstance where they're having to make choices about essential uh, medicines or uh, essential uh, other items, their rent, their food. 
Um, so, you know, that's the objective, uh, and we're very close to being able to talk in a fulsome way about what the uh, what the agreement might be. Uh, but uh, at this point, I can't go any deeper. Thank you, Minister. Il n'y a aucune autre question du journaliste sur le Zoom. That's all for media questions on the Zoom. So I'll turn it back over to the room for the signing ceremony. Merci. Thank you. Okay, we're going to invite the minister to come up and uh, sign the documents and uh, provide opportunity to take some photos. And I'll be there as the witness. <laughs> 